Thanks very much, Bruno. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to share some ideas with you today. So, I think David made some very complicated stuff look, look very simple. I'm going to make some very simple stuff look very complicated. <coughs> so, where I'd like to start is, is a bit of my own history with Simit. So I was working not for 50 years with Simit, but for nearly 25 years, from the early 1990s. And particularly with Steve Waddington, who I think is in the room here today somewhere. Stephen? Yeah, there at the back. Where we were working basically in Southern Africa with Rockefeller-funded uh, projects around a soil fertility network that Stephen was leading. And it was really building on a very long, a very strong uh, farming systems research which had been developed partly here at Simmer. They had a focus on maize and maize-based systems, but all the work was on legumes and on crop livestock in, uh, integration, hardly any on maize itself. And it was very much a regional network that was supporting national research teams, so really very much working with the national teams to try and strengthen those teams. And the problem we were looking at is this very typical one of maize dominated farming systems where 80 to 90 percent of the land will be dominated just by maize declining soil fertility or soil fertility that's so low it can't really decline any further and this need for diversification and this slide i took with steve in the field in around 98 i think and it actually encompasses most of the continent of africa we actually have the range of soil carbon that you have from the poorest fields to the best fields in africa You've got yields which actually go from the poorest yields you can find roughly to about the best yields. Five to six tons close to the house, virtually nothing away from the house. All within 50 meters distance. And we were out in the field then testing what we were calling then best bet technologies. So all of these different wonderful technologies that have been proven on research stations to give wonderful benefits of yield. Here we are in the field with a, a Simit DG, Tim Reeve, with, together with Steve and a whole group of people, together with the farmers, participatory research, and it's just terribly embarrassing because the technologies are failing. And they're failing consistently when we take them out to farm. And why is that? It's because farmers were actually giving us their very worst fields. They were giving us the fields where we were supposed to actually be able to improve soil fertility, but of course the technologies were failing because the green manures couldn't grow because of the poor soil fertility. And this is one of those wonderful examples of where basically there aren't silver bullets. These, these wonderful technologies, these best bets, when we take them out to the real environment, they fail. But this really gave us some fantastic insights into the system. And for me, when I went to work at Wageningen University after leaving the University of Zimbabwe, where I was working as professor, it actually gave me the opportunity to work with teams of systems analysis specialists to actually try and unpack this. And here's my idea of a model. So it's a cartoon model, but where we have all of the components of the farming system, the household, the, the, the home garden, the infields, the outfields, we have livestock. These livestock are producing manure. They're grazing in common lands. We have other households, so poor households as well. Within that, we have nutrient flows, nearly all going through the livestock to produce that manure. The manure is targeted back specifically to these fields close to the house. If farmers have fertilizers, they all put, so put them on these fields close to the house because that's their food security crop. We've got inputs and outputs in terms of labor and crops to market and the like. And we've got to look at this type of system when we're thinking about our our basket of options and the different technologies that we have to actually address soil fertility. So what we're dealing with is, is actually quite a simple system, but it's a system within which many choices are made and which, within which there are many trade-offs. And we can reduce that complexity down. We have wealthier farmers who have good fields. We have intermediate farmers who have these gradients because they have a limited amount of resource. And we have poor farmers who simply have poor fields and small fields. But can we go then from a, a diverse characterization of a farming system right down to actually just three types of fields there? And we can reduce this then down into our recommendation domains. 
So here we have three different types of responses. So we go from our on-station response, we have to put that through a farm filter so that we can recognize these different fields, the infields, the middle fields, and the outfields. The infields are poorly responsive because basically they're fertile. The responsive fields are those in between, and the outfields are basically they're poorly responsive. They're, they've been so exhausted that they need rehabilitation before they can really be used. But it took us a lot of time to actually get to this sort of understanding. And there are many people here in the audience, but Jamie Singori did much of the work actually behind this. But it's actually given us a basis then to go out and actually do some much more exciting things recently. So I'm, I'm leading a project called End to Africa, which is a Gates investment working across 11 countries. And we use this idea of a development to research project. So in End to Africa, we take the best technologies we have and we simply test them at scale. That's what we call the delivery and the dissemination. We go out, we test them with farmers. We have a shell of monitoring and evaluation around that. And our research basically becomes the analysis of our monitoring and evaluation with these feedback loops to try and look at continuously improvement of our technologies. And I want to give you one example here from the Highlands of Rwanda. This is a work with climbing beans, where these beans are absolutely fantastic in terms of their productivity when they're grown with manure and phosphorus. And you can see here a farmer, for me in the field, I can stand there, I'm about two meters, and I can't reach the top of these beans. They're wonderfully productive. But we go out and we test them on farm, and what do we find? On this graph, on the bottom axis, we've got the yield of climbing beans just with manure added. On the vertical axis, we've got uh, the beans with manure and phosphorus fertilizer. And what we find is that the very poor farmers basically have poor soils and they have poor yields. You can see that the addition of phosphorus fertilizer gives almost a doubling of yield for the very poor, but it's only an extra four to 500 kilos of grain. For the wealthiest farmers, they're already getting four times the yield, and the increment is also much larger in absolute terms when we use phosphorus fertilizer. So what's that due to? When we look then at the soil fertility, and we zoom in here looking at the soil carbon and the phosphorus, you'll see that the fields of the poor are actually very poor in fertility. The fields of the wealthier farmers are much richer in fertility. And what we're looking at here is the legacy of the past manure use, because the wealthier farmers have cattle, they can use more manure, they can maintain the yields in their fields. We can differentiate that by gender as well, and we find that women's, women generally have the worst fields. They get good response to phosphorus as well, but that's not as good as with the men. But it's not so simple, because if you look up the graph, you'll see some of the women's fields are just as well yielding as some of the men's. We can look at it further in terms of other production factors. And for beans, the number and quality of the stakes is very important. We find, again, that the poorer farmers have fewer, shorter stakes of poorer quality. And this then adds then to these poorer yields. And that leads us then with all of these different factors, production factors that actually go to give a good yield for us to understand why our technologies aren't performing perfectly all through the fields. And basically what it, what it shows us is that the poorest farmers are actually really very hard to reach. Now, I should be talking about maize, and why am I talking about legumes? Well, if we grow then our maize after the climbing beans, Here's the difference. On the right, there's maize following climbing beans, so a really important residual effect of the legumes. And we've just done a, a meta-analysis of this across uh, all the trials we can find from Africa. And you can see then on the bottom axis here, this is the yield of the cereal after the cereal. On the vertical axis is the percentage response to actually having the legume in rotation. And you can see very large responses there to growing maize in rotation with legumes. 100 to 200% increases, but basically we're talking about 800 kilos to a ton extra of simply getting a rotation with a legume. So for us to look at soil fertility for maize, obviously legume rotations are important. What can we do for the poorer farmers? Well, of course, it's hard to find technologies that will fit. 
This is in eastern Congo, in the Bukavu area. Here are farmers on the right with their livestock. These are guinea pigs. That's the, the livestock they have. And on the left, you've got beans grown with either no guinea pig manure or a teaspoonful of manure in the pocket. And of course, this isn't going to make these farmers rich. But actually, what we find is that they're actually yielding uh, an extra 500 kilos or so of, of, uh, of beans, and that can actually give the, far, the, the farm family something in the order of an extra two months or so of food security. What this gives us then is this idea we've got the different technologies, we've got farmer diversity, and in the center there we've got the technology suitability. Environmental factors, of course, condition that. We have farm factors and types which condition that on the farm diversity side. And then we find in places we have these technology farmer matches. It's the, the square peg in the square hole, if you like. But of course, the environmental factors are also conditioning for the farm factors and for the farmer diversity. So we need to take into account these different conditioning factors, particularly agroecological, but also the socioeconomic factors, when we're looking at trying to look at this idea of what we call them best fit technologies instead of what we were calling in the earlier 90s, in the 1990s, our best bet technologies. Now going on, if we think then, what are the major issues that we've got to deal with in, in terms of global food security? We've heard a lot about climate change. We've heard about these issues of demography, of poverty, and of inequality. 2016, the hottest year on record. World population stabilization unlikely this century. And then this problem of inequality, 1% in the world owning the, rest as, uh, owning the same wealth as the rest of the world put together. And what does this mean for, for agronomy? This is a, an analysis we've done of farming systems that we published in Global Food Security. On the top there you can see basically in places where you have high capital availability, on the left we get then where land is short, we get intensification. So we've got production there of these intensive poultry or pig systems in Europe. We've got intensive horticulture. On the right, we've got expansion, larger and larger farms. In the United States, in Australia, farms 7,000, 10,000 hectares or more, often still family farms with only one or two people working that land due to the benefits then of this of zero tillage conservation agriculture systems. Down on the bottom, we've got then for the developing regions, where capital availability is generally low, where land is scarce, we're getting this increasing marginalization just due to basically the shrinkage of farms over time. This is a, an analysis, a big data analysis, if you like, that we've done in collaboration with many people from the CG. It was led by Mark van Beek from Ilri, but, uh, Olaf Ehrenstein was involved but where we've been able to put together data sets for 17 countries, 93 sites, 13,000 farm surveys. And looking across this, if you look at the bottom, in the green we've got the, the crop consumption in terms of food availability, the orange is then uh, food crops being sold, and then as we go up you can see then in the blue cash crops, the, the red livestock, and the black, the importance of off-farm income. So the farmers who are food secure are usually those who are actually earning a lot of their money off-farm and not on-farm. And across this whole data set of 13,000 farms, more than 40% of those farms, around 40%, are actually food insecure. When we think then about this looking into the future, in the, in the short term time I've been working in Africa, the population's already doubled, going from about 0.4 billion to 0.8 billion. And that's going to add another billion in the next 20 years. Although farm sizes have started to shrink in Asia, farm sizes have started um, sorry, to grow in Asia with consolidation. Farm sizes are going to continue to shrink for the coming 20 years or more in Africa, putting even more pressure then on the situation for farmers. So to conclude, if we look then generally of these fantastic varietal gains that we've got in our maize, 
I'd argue then that farmers are really unable to take the benefits of those due to these other biophysical constraints, and particularly in Africa, the constraint of soil fertility. When we look at best fit technologies, and I'd argue here that Simit should be doing much more on legumes than non maize, of course, that we need then to have a whole basket of technologies, technologies that will work for the wealthy, but it'll also work for the poor. We can't afford to ignore the poor then. The big issue for me is that the productivity gains that we're achieving are actually being overtaken by population growth. And although we're here talking very positively about the fact of Africa becoming food secure, all of our analyses from the Global EBGA Atlas and the like are indicating that Africa cannot be food secure by 2050, even if we close all of the yield gaps that are there without massive land expansion, which of course we don't want, simply due to this burgeoning population. The population growth is mopping up all of the gains in productivity. I think the concerns we have then are of small farm size, which actually leads then to the poor economic gains for the farmer, the need to diversify out of farmers, out of farming, and that's why we see this aging of farmers. Aging of farmers in Africa, but we see that Australian farming globally. I'd argue then that we need to be focusing our agronomy very much on understanding what the future food systems look like. What should our future farming be? farming systems being, rather than focusing on the field level technologies. We need to be thinking then about diversification for nutrition. We need to be thinking surely about mechanization, removing the drudgery, and not only small scale mechanization, but also thinking about contracted services with tractors, which we see coming up more and more in different parts of Africa. And we need to be thinking about ways of transitioning out of agriculture and land consolidation and not simply trying to perpetuate poverty on small farms. And I'd argue, finally, that agricultural development depends so much on development outside agriculture, and vice versa, that we can't, as a community, actually address these problems without looking at the, the integrated economic growth of African countries. And the, the whole idea, if you like, of NAPAD and the like of, of of agriculture leading these countries out of poverty to me is, is a farce. I think we've got to understand that these countries need to industrialize and take actually people out of agriculture to allow agriculture to deliver, to deliver the contributions to food security that we need so much. So thank you very much.